Let me tell you about the music industry. It's never enough. You always want more. You could own every song in this world and you would still want that one more hit. It never ends. The greed never ends. You're never satisfied. There's never enough money. There's never enough hits. There's never enough tours. There's never enough arenas. I felt even though I was doing well, I could be doing better. But when I first started, I used to sell out Camden, no problem, Brixton, uh, Water Rats. And I thought, oh, you know, one day I'd really like to play Shepherd's Bush Empire. Empire, you know, that was the goal. Done it. Mm, one day I want to play Wembley. Done it. And and you, you can't help but just want more and more and more and more because you can't satisfy that need for validation and to, to be popular and to, for everyone to be talking about you and you be the best. There's probably a lot of young people who may not have had the same experience as you, but certainly they've had the same sensation of constantly looking for something to fulfill them, constantly trying to find the next thing. Do you feel like Christianity, faith could kind of make a return for young people? Often that's it's just assumed that's kind of done and dusted. Do you reckon it is making a return? I... Hello and welcome to Reenchanting with me, Justin Briley, and of course my co-host, Bell Tindall. And we are in a slightly different location to normal, aren't we, Bell? We are. We're nestled into a, a little corner of Lambeth Palace a, Library today. A corner of Lambeth Palace yeah. Library, but still surrounded by books. Um, so we are going to be asking our guest our signature question as normal today. But Reenchanting is the podcast which brings you perspectives from all different walks of life, looking at how we can reenchant a secular, material, post-Christian world with the Christian vision of reality. Indeed. And today we are joined by Talia Dean. Hi, Talia. Hello, Talia. Hello. Thank you for having me. We're Such excited to have you. I'm so excited. So I'm just going to introduce you. So for anyone who doesn't know Talia yet, um, she became a household name in 2017 after she wowed judges on The X Factor with his stunning vocals. I remember watching that. It's so Did weird. You? It's like I've stepped inside my TV. Yeah. <laughs> um, she went on to a successful music career, collaborating with Brian May from Queen and others. But Talia recently announced that she has quit the mainstream music industry after rediscovering her Catholic faith in a big way at the end of last year. And so we're going to be talking to Talia about what sparked her return to her faith and about her new role with Cafford's Big Pilgrimage 2024. Welcome to Lambeth Palace Library. Wow, that was a big statement, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that was no a big old intro. Uh, well, I'm, I'm really excited about this conversation, Talia, because it sounds like something really interesting has happened in the last year or so to you. And we're going to find out all about that. But we always, as I said earlier, have a signature question Ooh. whenever anyone joins us on Reenchanting. Because we film in a library, what have you been reading recently? Well, interestingly, I have recently started a Bible course oh. and I am right reading the Bible from beginning to end. Wow. And I've made it my mission to complete the Bible by the end of the year. Is that something by you've ever done before? Year? Have you ever sort of I've... tried to read the Bible in like full in that way no I've read scriptures yeah. and I know the stories I went to a catholic school when I was a child so you know I know but mm. this time I really want to know you know what is exodus mm. what what mm. did Mark say I, mm. I want to mm. know mm. it not mm. just read it mm. so I started from the beginning fair play in the beginning, in the <laughs> beginning. Literally, literally the beginning in the beginning and now I'm currently halfway through exodus oh wow um yeah it, now it Let's be honest, it, it gets quite tough at some points. Lots of long lists of names, lots of these that and this and that. On. It does go on. Who are they? Have you got anything to help you in that journey? Like, is, is there a kind of a Bible reading plan you're following that kind of mixes it up a bit? Or are you just kind of going for it from... Genesis to Revelation. Okay, so I'm not very good at reading and writing, even though my career is writing for a living. <laughs> I'm not good at it. Um, but I found the apps really helpful. Mm. You know, the ones that read to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, that's just beautiful. When you go into sleep at night or you think, oh, I could just do with a quick chapter and mm. in your ears it goes. And that's made all the difference. Sometimes having to, especially when you're dyslexic, when you have a Bible in front of you and you know the pages are very thin and it's a lot of writing, it's yep. overwhelming. Yeah. Um, 
so I think, it, you know, technology these days have, have been so helpful. It's mm. not always so negative. It's yeah. the first time that I've really managed to get stuck in. Yeah. No, it's great. So, do you know what, Talia? Considering this is a podcast where we have a lot of Christians on, you're the first person whose answer has ever been the Bible. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yeah, you I know. Are. It's funny. I guess, I, yeah. Nicely it, done. It, it, and really? it's yeah. doubly ironic given that there are probably a lot of Bibles in this library. That's, as that's well. because everyone's read it. <laughs> I'm nearly 40. I don't know. I'm only reading I, it now. To be honest, Talia, I think there's a lot of Christians who haven't actually read that much of the Bible. So so I think probably there's a lot of people who would, would be in a similar position. It's important to me. And I yeah. think it's such a beautiful book. There is something mm. about having an actual book and you mm. can feel the mm. pages yes. and the text. And that's beautiful. And it's just a shame that I have this dyslexia because I struggle. But when I can listen to it, and see the writing it really helps but that, that is one of the beauties of apps and you know the ways you can now engage with the bible and the one i love without the other ones are available but <laughs> have you ever heard david suchet who, who plays poirot doing the no niv way. bible he's done the whole thing you're joking and it's just it's like music to your ears when david suchet <laughs> really? reads it he's just got such a beautiful voice i need to listen to yeah that. yeah anyway <laughs> Well, anyway, welcome and thank you for, for joining us. Um, mm. Could could you, before we kind of go into what's happened recently mm -hmm. in your sort of spiritual journey, take us back to 2017, the oh. year you were on The X Factor. Um, what what led you firstly to being in that competition? Oh. Hmm. At the time, I just had a baby mm. and I was feeling extremely... Um, I guess crushed, you know, I'm going to be honest as, mm. as a mum, first time mum, and it was very full on. I was doing a lot of it on my own. I felt like I was missing a huge part of me because pre baby, I was still touring up until seven months pregnant. Mm. Everything was music, music, music. And then this beautiful bundle of joy comes along and I'm in pajamas for four weeks and I've not <laughs> sung a note. And it came to me. I just got an email saying, you know, would you consider auditioning? Um, and it was a generic email. It wasn't, you know, mm. they pinpointed mm. me. Mm. And I thought, yeah, yeah, just to get out for the day, just to experience yeah. something. Right. I never in a million years thought I would just smash through every round. That was just really unexpected. I was just happy to stand in a queue and have yeah. a coffee yeah. and meet people and just not, you know, be on mum mode just for one day like that's all I wanted <laughs> but even though when I was auditioning and I was queuing up I was thinking oh I want to go home now you know you miss your baby don't you mm, yeah. mm. um but there was no going home <laughs> no <laughs> nine hours I stood in that queue oh wow, wow. nine hours yeah Gosh. so when you do um do your audition and you're like oh wow this is how basically i think my first question is how soon do you realize oh this isn't just me having a day out this could change things and then how does that feel as you go through all these process you suddenly well i suddenly realized um when i first went through well you do screen tests first you never okay. just walk into the judges right and um, we'll have to check my <laughs> my contract there am i not to say that <laughs> but you, you have to do a screen test yeah, anyway and yeah. use background checks you yeah, know then they're, they're yeah. very there's a lot of safeguard of and they're not going to throw anyone mm, yeah. on telly. Mm. Um, and it was when I was in with the producers and they all start giving the eyes to each other <laughs> and they all start like, grinning and okay. you think they look very happy. Okay. And that's when I knew there was something magical mm. happening. Mm. Um, and then suddenly I was treated a little different mm -hmm. to the others. Okay. Um, yeah, you can see the, the right. cogs turning very, mm. very early on. How, how how much of it is kind of true to what you see on the screen? I mean, I'm sure it must be quite different when you're backstage and in the whole machine, basically. It's terrifying. For the three minutes that you see me singing, yeah. I've been there since five in the morning. Right. Mm. You know, and, and it's a lot of waiting around. It's a lot of everyone has to wait their turn. Um well, when I first queued, there were 60,000 people, yeah. you know, and then when you get to boot camp, there's another, you know, 8,000 and it's, it's a lot of waiting. There's only six vocal coaches, yeah. you know, well, there's only 10 producers and mm. everyone has to wait mm. their turn. So what they do is they make you get up very early. Let's check my contract again <laughs> on this and um, get up very early and wait um, and all you're thinking is, please just not, I just don't want to embarrass myself. Please can this go well? <laughs> Singing over and over and over again. 
Um, and it's just a lot of praying. Yeah. Wow. I, so, so when you're sort of in those final, like you finally got through and you're, you're kind of on TV each week and you know, that whole process is going on. Do you, does it, I mean, was it just incredibly pressurized? What, what were some of the highs and lows of, of suddenly being put so massively in the public spotlight? At that time. I'm I'm a one off because mm. a lot of people have horror stories, but mm. I really enjoyed right. my experience. Okay. Good. And I think that's maybe maybe they liked me and they treated me nicely. Yeah. I know yeah. people have had terrible mm. experiences and I'd never take that away from them. But mine was really good. Mm. And I I originally wanted to go on X Factor because I wanted to know the business. Mm -hmm. I wanted to mm. know what the producers were doing. I wanted to know what the music team were doing. I wanted to know everything. I wasn't going there to be famous. Mm. I was going there to, to educate myself. And every round I got further for me, I, I felt like a little private investigator, <laughs> you know, behind the scenes yeah. doing my own documentary. And I did document it and wow. it's, it's on YouTube mm. every stage. Mm. Um, and I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah. But the further I got on, every round I got through, I thought, mm, I think I really want this now. Right. Mm. Oh, and I really want this now. <laughs> and oh, I just want I just want to get through boot camp. And then I got through boot camp. And I, oh, I just want to get through six chair. And, yeah, yeah. and it's suddenly um, the ball changes and yeah. the goals change. Mm. And what you wanted, what I wanted mm. was to educate myself. I suddenly, the greed started to come in and the obsession of fame come in. The more I sold the most stories of every contestant, right. they were obsessed with writing about me, okay. good and bad. Mm. And the more they did it, the more I wanted, the more I went out in public and people wanted my photo, the more I wanted. And suddenly that greed just took over. Right. And it flipped quite heavily. Flipped and the and did, were you almost like aware of that happening or did it just sort of happen kind of yeah, without you really? I was completely aware that my ego had got out of control. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was just exploding. <laughs> and my friends were aware and everyone was aware that <laughs> I'd suddenly just turned into a monster. <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving this a already. A reality star monster. <laughs> <laughs> Why? You say you were, people were writing about you more than anyone else. Mm. Do you know why that was? Oh, because I just gob off don't I I just okay. like I don't <laughs> I don't um stick to the script I wasn't a very disciplined contestant and, okay. I, and I knew you know I was older I was in the overs you know I was a really old lady over 25 so <laughs> that's I was so in, ironic isn't I was it? in the but, overs yeah. wow. so I knew about press I knew how things yeah. were I knew if I went to a club and I caused a scene I knew it would be in the paper the next day so mm. I think that's why they liked me as okay. well because we worked together yeah. quite a lot yeah yeah and do you get, again, this is me just wanting to peek behind the curtain. Um, how much support do you get? Because all of this is so new. Mm. Like how much, how much kind of like, how, do they surround you? Do they support you? Do they tell you this might happen, deal with it this way? Or are you just kind um, of left to deal with all this newness? They do. They really, really support you when you get far. So mm. right. I'd say up between... Boot camp, no, not boot camp. Six chair challenge and mm. judges' houses. So that's midway. Yeah. Then they start really supporting you. Okay. They realise that the pressure becomes mm. a lot bigger than what yeah. it was before. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, I just had a baby. I had, I was a bit wobbly in the yeah. brain and all of that. So they did send me places and make sure that I was perfectly fine to fly to Africa. They're not just going to fly anyone right. to Africa, mm. are they? Mm. Right. South okay. Africa, sorry. Yeah. Um, and they were very supportive musically, mentally. When mm. we all lived together, we had like a mum of the house. She lived with us and she'd cook us dinner. And yeah, they mm. were great. They mm. were great. Mm. Yeah. And, and just remind us in the end how far you got on, on that series. I was kicked out at judges' houses. And then I was brought back um, to the live show finals right. and I lasted the second or third week yeah, mm. yeah, if I remember yeah, rightly yeah. but what was interesting it was the third time the public had brought me back right. and on the last time of the wild card they said that they had never had a vote like that in the wow. history of mm. X Factor so you had a big appeal obviously to the public and, and so on I'm just fascinated given your recent journey like what what was your background coming into this? Obviously, you'd you'd been you you're a musician. You you know uh, you you had ex some experience of this world. What what did you have in terms of faith? Um, what what was kind of going on for you at that point when you were getting into the X Factor? What faith? Right. Zero zilch. Uh, but you had some kind of 
Catholic upbringing. I was born a Catholic, so I'm right. a cradle Catholic, yeah. and I was raised as a Catholic. I went to Catholic primary school. The values were there. I knew every prayer. I mm. knew the Eucharist. I, it was deep in me. I had yeah. my Holy Communion. Um, but the, the, the issue for me is my parents sent me to an atheist secondary school, and I think that really impacted on me quite massively because I was very religious as a child. I was right. terrified of doing anything wrong. Right. I loved Jesus. I loved Mary. They felt like my friends when I was little. Um, you know, and being from a Roman Catholic background, my my Italian family, very, very religious, you mm. know, very strict. But soon as I mixed with non-religious people and went to a, and there was no prayer in the morning at school and that's five years isn't it mm. five years of no god is enough to just right. turn anyone you just kind of it just sort of evaporated almost as you went through secondary school not then. completely because i was never i still had my morals mm. um i was never really bad you know i never veered <laughs> too deeply i never started worshiping anyone i shouldn't but there was still um it, it wasn't at the forefront mm, anymore yeah. mm, mm. i suddenly realized well that just seems like a distant story now yeah. a distant memory i don't mm, feel i didn't mm. feel god yeah. anymore i didn't feel his presence i felt like everything was a struggle as a child mm. and i thought well if I'm struggling this much, there is no way there could be a God because he wouldn't right. let me struggle like mm. this. Mm. So I need to rely on other people, mm. you know, like support workers mm. and yeah. mm. people that were, I could see, feel, yeah. touch. Mm. Yeah. That makes sense. So I'm excited to circle back around to where you're at now. But before that, just carrying on with your story a little bit, life straight after X Factor and then what came how does how does it feel a life after x factor to be honest uh, when x factor finished i really wanted to be as far away from it as possible mm. okay um it it did get overwhelming especially when i'd been booted off the show you do f feel like a bit of a failure and mm. you think okay i don't know what to do now it, that's ironic to... because in a sense like you said you were one of hundreds of thousands of people who applied for that show and mm -hmm. you ca got into what is effectively a very small bunch of people, but even leaving at the point you did, you still felt like oh, something grief, of a failure. Complete grief, yeah. Because you, when you hit the heights, yeah. you, you cannot bear being any <laughs> lower. Mm. <laughs> and if someone had said to me at the time, right, you're going to go on X Factor. You're not going to go very far though. You're just going to go to judges' houses. You're going to be a bit, a bit embarrassed, but you're going to be out to the world. You are going to be kicked out of judges' houses. Do you still want to do it? I said, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I'll be up for it. Mm. But for some reason, I still was never satisfied. Mm. You know, even getting kicked out at the finals, well, mm. I should have won. <laughs> yeah. Why didn't I win? And, and, your, and your goalposts change. Yes, of course. Every, the further mm. you get, the more deep you get into that greedy world, mm. the more mm. you want. Do you think, though, so like your story in particular, where you got to judges' houses and then it kind of all fell down, but then you got brought back. And then, like you say, you were the like public kept voting you, voting you in and voting you in and voting you in. Is it is that an emo emotional roller coaster though? In that like you're handed something and then it's taken away and then you're handed it back. Like I think anyone would be a little bit bewildered, mm. particularly with the way your story unfolded. Yeah, I think I started to realise that I was really making the show, mm. and it didn't matter what I did; it was never in my control. Mm. Okay. Um, and. And I think at that point, I realized that there is a plan that's going to happen whether I like it or not. Mm. Right. And I just need to go with the flow or leave. Mm. And right. I wasn't going to leave. Right. Mm. Um, when, you know, I, I performed at Wembley, at the sixth chair, and 4,000 people were screaming, bring her back, right. bring her back. And I didn't even hear any of them. Right. I was, mm. I was at the back of backstage in the green room, packing my suitcase, <laughs> putting my shoes back on because mm. I never sang with shoes on <laughs> and just thinking, OK, well, this is it. I'm really depressed, but um, this is I've, I've done well. I've done yeah. well. And then I looked to the corner and there's about four producers radio in. Where's Talia? Where's Talia? And they're coming over to me and thinking, oh, what do they want? What do they want? What do they want? <laughs> and they said, quick, you need to come back on stage. You need to get get your shoes off again and come back on stage. <laughs> and I'm packing, ready to go. Yeah. Wow. And I've walked out on stage and it was just so overwhelming. Um, I just 
broke, I had a full on panic attack because wow. they didn't tell me that the mm. audience were calling me back. They didn't tell me that there's a chance that once you're off, you can be brought back again. Yeah. And oh, I walked right. out and it was, well, you know, Wembley Arena, yeah. It, yeah. it was just packed. And second I walked out again, everyone just went nuts and I couldn't cope. <laughs> I couldn't cope. So they had to close the curtain, um, get the, the psychologist to come over and she grabbed my face and she was like, this is a good thing. This is a good thing. <laughs> you can do this I'm going what's going on this she was like they want you back they want you back and I said I can't do it I can't do it she went come on get out there get out there um and you can see and then you the only bit they show is the moment that I go out after the right. psychologist have grabbed right. my head that second okay. time um, yeah. and that you see the yeah. second time right. and I walked out and I was just like this <laughs> I couldn't believe it wow. and mm. I thought I'm just going to have to go with this. I'm going to have to go with this ride because it doesn't matter if it's mm. a good thing or a mm. bad thing. Mm. I'm going to feel a bit unstable and a bit yeah. edgy. Yeah. It's like the whole people want me, no, they don't. No, they, <laughs> don't, no, they yeah. do. No, they don't. But it, no, it's, they, do they want me? It, it, yeah. But it's almost like that that whole thing of suddenly your fortunes are completely bound to popularity, basically, mm. to like what the people think of me and so on. And it's kind of like I can see how that's, in some ways intoxicating because it's that sense of oh look i'm i've yeah. made it and then but it could all be taken away in a moment and that's that's the ride you go and on and you isn't think it? i thought well well why didn't they like me yeah. i sang that i sang macy gray i try i i changed the version i'd done a piano version yeah. it and ev i got a stand innovation and yeah. i was the only one to have a stand innovation in the three six chair challenges yeah. so when they say I'm going to take Talia's seat from her. I thought, I couldn't have done any more. Yeah, like, why yeah, have you kicked yeah, me off? Yeah. Mm. I got a stand innovation. Yeah. Why have you kicked me off? And you just never feel good enough. Mm. You always feel, mm. I always felt like, um, like how could I be more like Grace? How could mm. I be more mm. like Tracy? Because mm. they still, you mm. constantly think in you're strategies. Com comparing yourself. Comparing yeah, yourself. Yeah, Maybe yeah. I shouldn't have worn my hair that yeah, day. Wow. It, it was, um, it makes your uh, I can imagine it takes a huge confidence go. Yeah. A, a huge toll on your, your mental health in many ways. And, and obviously once you did move on from the X Factor and you had to say goodbye to all that, I think, you know, you, you went on to have a successful music career. Um, tell us a little bit about the friendship you kind of ended up having with Brian May. Of Sir Queen Brian Fest. May. Sir Brian May, <laughs> I should say. I should say. Um, I was always friends with... Bry anyway. Mm. Um, I'd met him at work. I did used you to just call him Bry? Bry. Yeah, <laughs> did you hear that? <laughs> My mate Bry. Bry May. Bry May. Um, I was always friends with him. I used to be his assistant at the airport. Um, um, I'd make sure that he caught his flights on time because he likes to chat around the mm, airport. You mm. can't move him. Right. Um, so you have to like shimmy him on. But he, I was always his and Anita's assistant. So, mm. and it wasn't until about two years in I said, by the way, I actually sing. <laughs> and I knew that day was coming. And I, yeah. I took my time with it. And I could have got fired for it as well. Because you're not allowed to do it. But I'm glad I did. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't fired. And then, um, yeah, and he said, oh, send me some of your songs. So I said, oh, okay, I will do. And I sent him some songs. And this is actually before X Factor. Mm. So maybe mm. a couple of months before. Mm. And I, he never got back to me. Mm. Must have been busy in some band or something. I don't know. What he's doing. I don't know what he actually does. <laughs> and uh, and then I went for X Factor, and I remember him being really disappointed that I'd done that because he he said, you know, you didn't need it. You're very right. talented okay. and everything. But mm. I still never heard anything about my tracks. Mm. Um, and then he watched the show and I remember he was outraged and he'd done a big post. How dare they kick her off the show like a protective dad like he was nice. so angry. Yeah. Um, and I was like, I'm sorry, I know you said not to do it, but I've done it and now I'm embarrassed. Um, and then when it had all calmed down and I'd stopped um, doing, because they send you on little tours and everything, mm. don't they? With ex You're basically theirs for a year right. after the show. Okay. When that had calmed down, Bry said... Um, by the way, that song you sent me, I love it mm. and I want to work on it. And we wrote Get Up together. Mm. It grew and it was one of the biggest streamed songs during the pandemic. Yeah. So, yeah. There you go. Uh, so, I mean, you've had, as you say, it's been a friendship uh, as much as a, a mentor and, you know, yeah. a collaborator in the end on music. So that's, so you've kind of been in the world of music 
essentially probably pretty much most of your adult oh, working forever. life in, in one way or another. I was touring before yeah. Yeah. I'd even had yeah. a baby, you know. I probably wrote my first song when I was about eight mm. or nine. And obviously X Factor kind of propelled you into the public eye in mm. a way that perhaps was different to before. Mm. Um, did you feel like, I don't know, did you feel like, hey, I've made it now, this is where I want to be, or was there, I guess, was that feeling of like still comparing yourself to others, I guess, was that always there along the way? Let me tell you about the music industry. It's never enough. You always want more. You mm. could own every song in this world and you would still want that one more hit. Mm. It never ends. The greed never ends. You're never satisfied. There's never enough money. There's never enough hits. There's never enough tours. There's never enough arenas. You, Because I felt like even though I was doing well, I could be doing better. Mm. And you do compare yourself to there, everybody. There's always a Taylor Swift somewhere there's, above there's you. There's always Taylor somewhere <laughs> that's doing better than you. <laughs> always. But when I first started, I just wanted to sell out. I used to sell out Camden, no problem, Brixton, mm. uh, Water Rats. You know, I'm old school. I'm underground with the ska mm. bands, and that's what I used to do. And I thought, oh, you know, one day I'd really like to play Shepherd's Bush Empire. You know, that was the goal. Done it. Mm, one day mm. I want to play Wembley, done it. And and it, mm. you can't help yeah. but just want more mm. and more mm. and more and more because you can't satisfy that need mm. for validation yeah. and mm. to, to be popular and mm. to, for everyone to be talking about you and you be the best. But unfortunately, to meet that massive Taylor Swift level, mm. it's the ultimate sacrifice that very few get offered yeah. mm. and it's really really hard to maintain it i don't think any of these people have easy lives at mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. yeah. i think they sleep <laughs> yeah, yeah i think you're right does that mean as well then that when you do hit these things that you were dreaming of like shepherd's bush is is the joy of that robbed from you can you enjoy it in its fullness or are you just always on to the next thing? You know, yeah, I just never think, oh, that was amazing. And then you yeah. you bask in this success for about a week and you think, oh, don't have that. You get off the mm -hmm. stage and go, right, what's next? Mm -hmm. It's like a drug. It's so addictive because it is validation and, yeah. and it's adrenaline and mm -hmm. it's that high the same way a drug would give you that. Um, and and. It, to come down from that is really difficult, yeah. really difficult. And it's either you just give the whole lot up or you keep going, keep going. Well, I mean, speaking of the drug analogy, I mean, earlier this year, you announced that you were kind of rejecting. I was wondering where you were going then. No, no, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> no, I was you kind of have gone cold turkey, let's call it, on the music industry, if that's the drug, the drug of choice, if you like. You sort of announced that you were kind of... So what, what led to that decision, basically? Well, it, th there's some truths in that. You mm. know, the, the papers love to yeah. um, twist This is things. the spin they put yeah, on it. This yeah, this is the spin that they loved. Um, I put out a silly post um, a couple of weeks ago just saying, you know, that I'm starting Christian music now. And mm. um, suddenly somehow that was turned on that they said, oh, you're turning your back on the music industry and mm. joining a cult. And Yeah, I, and I saw the, the headline cult. in the mirror. It said, X Factor star sparks concern with new <laughs> photos as fans worry she's part, part of, a, of cult. a cult. I know, and I phoned my boyfriend and I said, oh, my goodness, what's going on? Like, we can't have this. This is a massive mistake. Quick, edit the post, edit the post. But the papers had already run with it. But there's some truth in it. Um, I... I am releasing another single in the mainstream pop charts, shall we call it? And mm. it's probably one of my most proudest singles. Mm. Um, and emotionally and physically, musically, I don't think this is a good song to leave on. Mm -hmm. um, it's my mm. final collaboration with in mainstream with Sir Brian May. Mm. I've written a song that he adores and he is so proud of. He's playing a 16 bar guitar solo on it. And it doesn't get much better than that. And I thought, you know what? This is my out. You know, this this song is going to go crazy. It's amazing. It's really catchy. Everybody that's heard it just thinks it's a whopper. Mm. But after that, I just I just want to do something different. Mm. I really, really want to start writing songs that empower people and enlighten people and mm. share the word. 
If you enjoy listening to Reenchanting, then you'll probably enjoy our other two podcasts from Seen and Unseen. Seen and Unseen Aloud is a weekly dose of commentary on culture, trends, and current affairs. Godpod is a deeper dive into theology and faith, hosted by Graham Tomlin, Jane Williams, and Michael Lloyd. You can find them wherever you get your podcasts from. But now, back to today's episode of Reenchanting. Which leads us perfectly then to ask you, you spoke about your faith like in the early part of your life, but you're in a really different place to that now. Mm. Can you tell us the story? Like what's happened? <laughs> uh, what's to, happened? That's what what has happened? Says, what's happened? What's happened to you? <laughs> right. Do I sound like a mirror journalist right now? Yeah. Tell her what's happened. What's happened? She's um, all like Goddy now and she's a bit of a Bible basher now. Goddy is a oh, fun yeah, one. Goddy, yeah, Goddy. Oh, Talia, will you tell us how you got Goddy? I got, well, I'll tell you my Goddy story. Yeah. Um, like I said to you, there was just there just wasn't enough material or fi- financial gain that mm. I could get from music that would satisfy me. So I was always, uh, I was always a woman that was slightly cup half empty. Is that the right mm. half, yeah. half empty? Yeah, mm-hmm. and that greed, the the need for validation, the need to be famous, the need to have people screaming my name and all of that just got really out of control and I just thought well I'm never going to be happy and I used to just feel very empty all the time really empty um and it took it took its toll on me last December I just couldn't have felt any worse I don't know why there just wasn't anything that was making me happy and I'm not proud to say that I was drinking more and just trying to fulfill this emptiness that was inside me um, going out with friends and partying, but not really having a good time, right. just feeling like, yeah. what can I do? What can I do? Yeah. There must be something to spark yeah. some sort of love in me or something. I'm trying to fill a sort of a void a almost. A void, yeah. 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 And there was nothing. And I never asked to be on this path. I never thought, right, let me just get down on my knees and pray and mm-hmm. hopefully I'll be saved. I really believe that God came to me. Mm-hmm. And I remember New Year's Eve... Just gone, actually. I I was at my ultimate lowest and I knew in the back of my mind that I should probably go to a church or something and have a pray. And I went to my church, New Year's Eve, it was a Sunday. (laughs) Churches should be open on a Mm, Sunday, mm, you'd think, right? mm. My church was shut. (laughs) So I thought, I know, I'll go to a Church of England church, which I also love, St Andrews, and I went there and it was shut. Oh, no. I thought, you know what's not going to be shut? Hill song. I'm going to go there and see if I can. <laughs> right. Yeah, I went oh, wow. everywhere wow. and it was sharp. <laughs> What's going on? I don't it's know. Cold, it? <laughs> it was half 10 in the morning, like some church would have been open, but it wasn't. <laughs> so I went back to St. Andrews because it was very, very pretty. And I sat in the graveyard, a bit morbid, but it's pretty. Mm. You know, a church mm. yeah. graveyards, they're, mm. they're very yeah. old, aren't they? Mm. And they're very pretty. And I just sat there and thought, what is life? <laughs> and, um, Just standing in front of me was this lady and she said, hello, are you okay? And I said, not really. I feel like every door's just shut on me right now. And she said, would you like to come to my house for tea? I'm the vicar's wife. (laughs) Margaret, yeah. (laughs) We're we're friends now. She's great. And I went to her house for tea and I met her daughters and we were at the kitchen table like this and they all prayed for me and the sun came in through the window and it was just the most magical experience and I thought, wow, this is a really nice feeling. Mm. And from there, she said, have you thought about going on the Alpha course? Because I still wasn't very Mm. religious, Mm. wasn't very Catholic. Um, And I said, "Uh, I'd love to try it actually, I'd love to learn more. Um, And so I was put on the Alpha course from there and I came home actually from that day. I came home and it was New Year's Eve, like I said. And I went in my bedroom and I just said, There's no way, there's no way this could be real. There's no way that he just lit up the whole kitchen as they were praying. And I had all this amazing feeling. And I said, If you are real, show me again. And um, he did. He did in a way. Do you mind sharing uh, what that was? Or is that a very private thing? No, I can. Thing? I can. I, I, um, because you always think people don't believe you mm. when you say these things. Well, let me just say, however crazy it sounds, we're here to listen. And I've heard a lot of weird stuff in my time. And But God has a habit of surprising us. Oh, really? Yeah. So 
You're among friends. I'm among <laughs> friends. Okay. I was lying on my bed and I was looking out the window and it was all grey. I don't know if you remember New Year's Eve last year, but it was completely grey and rainy mm, and everything. Yeah. And I was just looking out the window and I said, if you're real, show me. Mm. If that was you, show me. And the, the clouds did part. And again, my whole room lit up and it was warm and mm. it was light and everything, you know, the mirrors were showing reflections on the walls and it was just lovely. And I thought, okay, but you know, this could just be a fluke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't you're the, believe you, you're you. in a skeptic. It's kind of, it, it always wants to say, Hmm, I'm like that in life. Yeah, you know, yeah, I like yeah. to push. I like to really know, don't just show me. I need yeah, to yeah. feel it. Mm. I need to feel it. So I said, okay, right, one last time. <laughs> one last time. Really? Three strikes know, and I'm in. Yeah, three strikes. I know you came to me at Margaret's house. I know you're part in the clouds now. And it wasn't just that he parted the clouds, what I believe. It was just so obvious. Everything was grey and mm. that little mm. gap in the clouds was just bright, bright and penetrating through mm. my window, my bedroom mm. window. The whole room was light. And then I said, show me again. The light dimmed and behind the light was a rainbow. Mm -hmm. And it was the most amazing thing. And I just started laughing like, no way. <laughs> yeah. No way. Yeah. Okay. All right. <laughs> fine. I believe you. But I thought I, I, I need to keep this moment. So I turned around to grab my phone like we do. I wish I, <laughs> wish I didn't do that. But I did. And when I turned back, the whole thing had gone. And it was all grey. And mm. actually, no, I'm telling a lie. The gap was there right. with the sun, but the rainbow yeah, had, had gone. gone. And I run out into my garden to look for the rainbow anywhere. I couldn't see it. Yeah. And, and that was before I really knew about the rainbow of promise. Um, yeah. But I just knew. I, I knew. To me, mm. it made sense. Mm. And some people, I tell that to, you know, they don't really believe me. But the ones that do, they get it. Mm. Um, and it was mad that from that moment, I completely surrendered. There's no way you can ask God three times to show himself, you <laughs> no, know. Fair enough. I pushed my luck with him. <laughs> but I think he knew that I needed yeah. to push yeah. my luck with him. And then I went on the Alpha course and I met my gorgeous boyfriend who is very, very Christian. And, <laughs> you know, just things started to happen. I started mm. to meet more Christians. I started to end up um, on courses. The, mm. And they were coming to me. Mm. The mm. doors were opening to me. How hard I fought in the music industry. Will you play my record? Will you play my record? Can I come and perform here? Can I? It was exhausting. Mm. But when I surrendered to God, just... E but there were just emails in my inbox and mm. courses on my doorstep and mm. you know people asking me for coffee and tea and do you want to come and sing at our Christmas um concert and mm. will you come and sing at our passion service and mm. and and the biggest thing that happened to me very recently is Cafford asked me to be their ambassador me um, me yeah. me I don't know why but yeah. there's something they saw in me and Dermot O'Leary that they chose us to yeah, this wow. year. And, and I remember, it's full circle, I remember raising money as a child for Cafford. You know, with your yeah, little yeah. cardboard boxes yeah. and you put yeah. the pennies in and it's full of two peas, but it's fine. Um, and I thought, wow, this is, this is incredible. Mm. Amazing. So you spoke, like you told us a little bit about how you were feeling in December. How has what you've been on since then and everything you've just described how do you feel like how does it feel different internally now would you say oh massively different i i still hadn't been confirmed right. and that's quite important with the catholic church okay and i knew that was something i needed to do and i embraced the power of the holy spirit and i got confirmed and it was amazing it was just this past easter i think just gone yeah yeah, yeah. Well, was it was it pentecost it was, you were confirmed uh, pentecost actually? weekend yeah. i was yeah. confirmed it couldn't wow. have been a better weekend wow. mm. um, and it was beautiful and i had all the people i loved there and i just felt i felt happy again. i didn't care anymore i didn't mm. i didn't need to be on mm. tv shows mm. and mm. i was just so relaxed i was happy to just sit in my room and do nothing Mm. and still feel very content. Right. I started to watch more Christian TV mm -hmm. and I got really fulfilled from it. I learned more about Jesus. I started to read the New Testament um, and I just felt so happy and content in my mm. life that the thought of going back mm. to where I was filled me with deep anxiety. Mm. And I suppose there's this whole, like we've spoken about how 
X Factor and, and your story and things, it was all like, they want me. Oh, no, they don't. I didn't mm. do enough. Now they want me again. Oh, no, I mustn't have done enough again. And I suppose, you know, the Christian faith is that there's the, the opposite of that, that there's like this love for you that never wavers or shakes and there's nothing you can do to increase it or decrease it. It just is. Is Did that... Was it like a switch then in your mind or is that still taking you? Because this is all so fresh. We should oh, just yeah. point out this is such a fresh journey for you. Is that still taking you a while for like that kind of that to sink in for you? No. It's done. That's There's so no great. doubt in my mind. I yeah. just I just know I'm loved and I know mm. the people who are around me love me as well. And even though sometimes I do feel a bit, have I upset God, you know, does does this person still love me? I do feel when I put my head back in the Bible or I listen to songs of faith, I'm I'm quickly realigned where mm, before mm. I never had that realigning mm. and I was constantly questioning things. There's no doubt in my mind that I'm on the right path now. Mm. Yeah, that's so interesting to hear. How how have other people responded to this sudden change in your life? Do they, uh, well, we've kind of seen the way that, you know, the tabloids are responding to it. But it's terrible. What, well, I know everyone thinks <laughs> she's in a cult. I mean, it's like, but it is kind of unusual for someone, I guess, both with your sort of, you know, celebrity background, but mm. also you know, who's, who's quite an influential, you say you're one of the overs. I think of you as quite young, actually. So, so it's Thank like, but, but that. The, that, yeah. Can you make sure that goes in? <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, I think it's almost like seen as sort of a bit weird, you know, that religion, Christianity is for kind of old people. They or don't whatever. like it. Yeah. They will never champion it. And I don't mm. understand. It makes mm. no sense to mm. me. When you turn to God and you feel enlightened, suddenly you're making people happy. You're making people smile. You want to do good in the world. Oh, let's tell everyone she's in a cult. Madness. Mm. What What about friends and family? What What, what have they seen? Oh, it's just another one of Talia's adventures, isn't it? <laughs> Should enough. be bored in six months. Yeah. <laughs> it's the X Factor all over again. Yeah, yeah. Cosmic. <laughs> six months have gone by, I'm still here. <laughs> no, it's, I mean, it helps that, you know, I'm with a partner who's on my journey with mm. me. That's mm. very supportive. Mm. Um, it helps that I've met friends mm. um who are very christian and catholic and from, from all different mm. uh christian faiths you know uh, they're so supportive so when people my nearest and dearest family you know laugh you know, oh she comes the bible bashar that's okay because mm. i have another hundred people mm. that support me and i I'm not embarrassed anymore and I'm really keen to say actually it's it's you that needs to hear this mm. and it's you that mm. needs to pick up a bible and read mm. it mm. I feel bad for you mm. where before I used to feel embarrassed right. mm. especially yeah. you know in secondary school knowing how strong you know if my friends came to my nonna's house who I lived with there'd be more pictures of Jesus than any of the grandchildren. And that was embarrassing <laughs> for me. It was so embarrassing. She had this huge last supper on the wall. And they're like, is that your family? I'm like, no, oh, that's Jesus. <laughs> um, and now I could, I could never be more proud of her. because wow. She did yeah. not give up her faith. Like mm. it was Jesus. Mm. What, what would you say, I guess, to the fact that there's probably a lot of young people who may not have had the same experience as you, but certainly they've had the same kind of sensation of of constantly looking for something to fulfill them, constantly mm. trying to find the next thing. And we live in a social media world where you are constantly having to compare yourself to other people who apparently are more successful, better looking, doing well in life. Uh, often, obviously, we know that's uh, not true. Mm -hmm. we, we kind of curate a certain image very often on social media. But do you feel like Christianity, faith could could kind of make a return for young people. Often that's, it's just assumed that's kind of done and dusted. Young people are never going to be. Has it not made a return? Well, what do you reckon? Do you reckon it is making a return? I, yeah. You're absolutely. talking Justin's language now. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Tell oh, him it's a leading question, I know. But it's... Um, I mean, here in the UK, and I've had this conversation with Cafford, we're, we're really struggling to find real leading hmm. young people that can that can really push, um, or not push, be proud of their mm. faith because mm. certain media channels and things like that, they put it in the contract. You're not allowed to talk about really? it. Okay. Now we're on a flip script where 
social media, we make the rules mm. up. We can post whatever we like as mm. long as we're not in a contract with anybody. We can say what we want. And you're finding that more and more young people, um, eccentric people and celebrities are starting to push through the mold and set a really good example of why you should follow Christianity, why you should be proud to talk about it. Mm. Um, and that almost inspires me to want to do mm. that as well. And I think with um, music that's coming out now, people like Stormzy, who I went to South Africa with, by oh, the way, wow, he was one of my judges. Yeah. You know, he's so proud to yeah. be such yeah. a religious man and mm. he will mm. put out music. And, and when people see him do it, other rappers now kind of gives them permission to sort yes. of be free about their own yeah i didn't even face. know about yeah. premier radio or yeah. anything like yeah. that and when yeah. i put it on now i'm hearing like trap music but it's about jesus <laughs> yeah, and I yeah, thought, yeah. Well, this is a cool man yeah. i'd much rather listen to that i'd much rather my son listen and, to that and I, I don't know whether whether you feel but i feel like there has been an interesting number of musicians who are kind of being more open about their face so just justin bieber is a good example of someone who seems to really kind of wear his faith quite openly now mm. um and and just a number of others like you say Stormzy and others who who are sort of it, it feels like I don't know is is it the fact that there's more of a kind of a, now you don't have to do everything through your agent through the music industry there's a social media and so on allows people that freedom to kind of talk about their faith more freely the freedom comes with freedom so right. when you are not under somebody hmm you can talk about what you want. Mm. And if you'll notice, Justin has a very different career to what he did right. 10 years ago. Okay. Stormzy has always done what he wanted. Yeah. He's always mm. ruled like he's... So there's something about the independence. That, you you that, need that to you be need. a little yeah. bit independent. And even with me, you know, I've done um, events and I've spoke at events or I've done um, online events. And always I will make sure that in my contract it doesn't say must not talk about religion. So that can literally be written into a contract. Every contract I've wow. ever had. That's Every single contract. Uh, you know, seven years ago, I wouldn't have had the power mm. to ask for that to be removed. Now I do, yeah. or I don't do it. Right. Interesting. And I think they would rather me do the event. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, that's fascinating. I had no idea such things would be written into contracts. I know. I'm going to be in trouble now, aren't I? If you never see me again, <laughs> this is why. This is You've why. You've gone public now. I've gone it's public. Too late. Yeah. So can you tell us about, you kind of hinted earlier that you're making a different kind of music now. I am, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I have started working with um, a team in Guildford who are amazing and actually, it was we we met up at the studio, and we were writing for Eurovision and and mm. trying to get some songs together. And I noticed that Pete, who's my producer, had a cross on his mm. neck, and I would never have noticed that before. But I said, "Christian Pete," and he went, "Yeah." And I went, "How deep?" He said, "I'm a worship leader." I said, "What? <laughs> You're a worship leader?" He said, "Yeah, every Sunday." I said, "We've never spoke about this." And said, you'd, you'd known him for some time at that yeah, point. Yeah, wow. and we'd all been arranging yeah. to meet up and okay. everything. And then I looked at Greg, who is also in my writing team, and he said, yeah, yeah we're Christians. <laughs> Why have you never mentioned it before? And he said, because you weren't. You know, you, yeah. you, and I said, no, no, I'm in the club now. <laughs> I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. And he said, um, do you want to do something? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, th this is... I was actually thinking after I've done all this writing with you guys, I'm going to go off and find a Christian producer. <laughs> anyway, from there, we started writing the most amazing, beautiful, enlightening songs about finding yourself and finding love in, in, from God and you know, wow. Jesus take the will and just surrender. And this, this album, because it's going to be an album, mm. Mm, is probably going to be the most satisfying thing i've ever done mm. and i'll be proud of it mm. um wow. I'm, and i'm hoping that brian might do a 16 bar solo <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well this know. is a question we haven't asked yet which is how did brian take a that you're goddy now and b <laughs> that you weren't going to make any more like Secular, or that you mainstream, were, yeah. yeah, but that's maybe a bit too black and white. That's what the papers have produced. Yeah, it, like, that you're yeah, tilting you slightly. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I wouldn't say I'm never making no. mainstream music yeah, again. Sure. I would just say my full focus now is mm -hmm. on my Christian album. Mm -hmm. And 
Rye was so proud of me. He was so happy for me. And he said, you know, this is really good. This is really good. You've mm. changed. He noticed the change in me. He mm. sees how happy I am. And what you won't notice about Queen is they've got a lot of songs that really do show enlightenment. Mm. And mm. They, they have got a couple of songs about God that you mm. probably mm. wouldn't know unless mm. I showed you and went... Yeah. Read it, the lyrics yeah, properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he's a man of faith mm. and he believes that the world should be better with love and full mm. of love. And he's the most humble mm. man you'll ever meet, caring, loving. And I, I wouldn't say he was Christian in a sense, mm. but he would be the perfect mm. Christian man mm. on text. But the yeah. way he lives his life and the way he just loves people. And so for him to know that I've dedicated my life to God now he was so proud and so happy really really is and I've shown him the songs he loves them yeah. amazing mm. so you could you know slip a little solo in there you never how, know how cool would it be to have Brian May like lead, doing a guitar solo at your church during the worship <laughs> set he that'd does be, he does that anyway that'd be, nice. be amazing we do a carol concert every year in Windlesham and he comes and solos. Oh, yeah. amazing. Yeah, we oh, sing away yeah. in a manger and he's like... <laughs> 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 it's really good. That's so cool. You do realise that's going to be a flooded old carol singer this year now. You've let the cat out of the bag. Oh, no. <laughs> Don't say which shit. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say the church or the date. <laughs> yeah. Um, I know that you've also battled some serious health issues over the years. Um, I, do, you want, do you want to kind of sketch out how your your turn to faith has kind of maybe impacted that that area of your life as well. Hmm. In 2020, I was diagnosed with a condition called ankylosing spondylar arthritis. Wow. <laughs> we'll just call it AS for <laughs> okay. short. Yeah. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it is under the uh, autoimmune umbrella, which causes a lot of rheumatoid issues. So I spent, from the age of 17 till maybe 34 in in chronic pain wow. really chronic pain yeah. just feel like i was on fire every day um my eyes were burning uh, my back was so sore i couldn't put any weight on my hips and and, the, and uh, that affects my sleep which also affects my mood um and i just was not a very happy girl in my 20s or early 30s and they missed my diagnosis many times um it should have been straightforward but it wasn't and I don't know why I slipped through the net um but I was diagnosed in 2020 and now I, I'm on treatment and they've mm. said I'm in remission now and mm. I'm not attacking my own body anymore but I do have an irreparable damage mm. and there are risks in the future um but I believe had I have been of faith when I was really sick, mm -hmm. it would have lowered my stress. Mm -hmm. I would have felt yeah. a lot more happy. Mm -hmm. um, I believe that I could have gone for healing and had some anointing. You know, I, mm -hmm. I could have done things that would make me feel loved mm -hmm. and make me feel like that I'm going to get through this yeah. and mm -hmm. feel supported. Mm -hmm. But I didn't. I didn't mm -hmm. have any guidance or any help or any healing. Um I didn't know how to pray because sometimes praying can be very mm. relaxing mm. and mm. you can offload your problems and mm. offload your illnesses and mm. feel like somebody's there watching over you. And I just didn't have any of that for, for them all them years from the age of 17 to 34. Now, mm -hmm. <laughs> now when I when I'm feeling ill, I go to my priest and I say, you know, come on, let's. Let's get the oils out and I do feel good right. I do feel yeah. good yeah. I, I honestly believe it works when I go to church every Sunday um I feel like I'm it's my medicine it's mm. my therapy mm. and mm. I feel uplifted and being uplifted when you're sick is I think is fundamental mm. There's yeah. nothing worse than being sick and also depressed and feeling mm. alone yeah. and feeling like you've got no um, mm. divine power on mm. your side mm. and it will make you sit worse I believe mm. yeah Gosh. and they've said to me you know with having AS very rarely do you go into remission very rarely does it just go mm. and mm. I haven't 
oh, I need to touch wood now. <laughs> is this real wood? <laughs> Something. <laughs> yeah, but my my inflammation levels are at zero. Gosh, I'm not in any pain. Yeah. Of course, I have bad days. Yeah. Yeah. And I yeah. do get flare ups and I do get tired. Fatigue is a massive thing with mm. AS. When you mm. get tired, you just hit a wall mm. and you can't cope anymore. It's like live. It's like going on a long haul flight. That's what I feel like when my pain mm. starts coming. And I haven't had that for a really long time. That's, that's really good to hear. Um, and, and in a way, there's a sense in which none of us are insulated from the trials of life, mm. illness, um, you know, tragedy sometimes mm. and things like that and i guess you've experienced that the highs and lows of the music industry and the way that you were chasing the, the fame and the you know the popularity and so on what what would you say is the you know as we start to bring this into to land the the way in which essentially becoming a christian in the last year has kind of changed the way that you now i guess look at life maybe look at music look at family look at health look at career what what's the kind of fundamental shift would you say that's taken place in in your life in that way well my morals have changed completely mm. i i couldn't care less about fame now mm. um which must feel so freeing oh, I so freeing yeah. i'm so free <laughs> i really am i just mm. don't feel like oh i need to i need to you know my post needs to have over a hundred mm. likes otherwise yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm a failure yeah, everything yeah. i did i felt like right. a failure it was always about like how much validation basically yeah you and got. social yeah. media is yeah. Daily, yeah. daily yeah. failure is enough to drive everybody <laughs> yeah, mental. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but now my my goalposts, you mm. know, I really love kids and I really want to do, you know, workshops with children. I want to spread the word of the Bible. I really want to teach people and um, fundamental morals and and empower people. You know, I don't want to do that before. I wanted to go out and have fun, <laughs> mm. you know, and I've met an amazing man who wants to go on that journey with me. Maybe we'll do a podcast mm. as well. Everything mm. for me mm. is seek his kingdom first. Okay. And that is, is what dominoes everything else in my life. So if there's a task I need to do, for example, um, if I'm going to do a concert, you know, I'd need to pray first. I'd mm. need to make sure it's the right concert because mm. I'd want it to run by mm. God and what yeah. God would want. Yeah. And that makes me happy. There's only mm. one person that's mm. judging me now that could only, right. only ever judge yeah. me. I was judged before by Simon Cow, even people I didn't know in the street, mm. you know, trolling. In like trolling the most literal way, in a way that I think a lot of us will never experience, but you have been literally, you know what judgment feels like in like the most acute and literal way. <laughs> it's ho horrible. Yeah. And, and what happens is you think you become resilient to trolling. You don't. It's, mm. it's like a wall that chips and chips and chips. Mm. And where I used to be very, very guarded and quite a stern girl, mm. I, um, mm. I'm, I don't... Going to Christianity has made me actually quite vulnerable because I've yeah. had to let my guard down a yeah. little bit, but it means people can get me a lot easier. And I believe sometimes that's bad spirits and right. things, and mm. I have to constantly say, you know, get behind me, Satan, because mm. mm. you're not going to ruin my day. Mm. Um, but it does get to me a lot, even the most silliest things, like mm. that blue dress is horrible. Mm. And I'm like, oh, why, why yeah. have they said that to me? Maybe I should have worn this dress. And then I just have to go, no. Yeah. It's if, like you have to remind yourself that's not where my identity lies anymore. No. It, that stuff is is not kind of, I'm not yeah. going to allow that to, to No, but I'm still human me. when yeah. I'm tired and stuff, yeah. you know, things get to me. But yeah. now having a full focus of one higher power, God, um, I don't worry about yeah. mm. what everybody yeah. else says. I only care about mm. whether I'm doing right mm. by the church and right by Christianity. Mm. And I think that's where a lot of people go wrong in this life. When you have no one to follow, you end up in gangs or you end up in these worlds that you you wouldn't normally be a part of because you've got no guidance and you've got no love in your life mm. and you, you're not following a higher power. Mm. You're very vulnerable to control coercive control political control just mm. i feel like if i just have one agenda yeah i'm yeah. happy mm. and it's a 
good one too. Yeah. It is. Oh, Talia, this has been so fun. You said it earlier, but you said it in regards to the music industry. But I think it's like the thing of your whole story where you just said freedom comes from freedom. Mm -hmm. And you were saying it in regards to like agents and things. But that seems to be like the motto of your life and the motto of this story you've told. And I'm just really thankful you've told it to mm. us. It's yeah. been a so joy, a total yeah. joy. Um, do, do by the way, if you're watching or listening, um, check out The Big Pilgrimage for Cathod because you're oh, sort of yes. helping to front that, I believe, this year. Mm. Tell I us, did front it. Yeah, well, so tell us a little bit about it and what, what, what was involved. Um, oh, it was beautiful. We went to St George's Cathedral in London and I was performing my songs and a few covers as well and what the Londoners were doing was doing a walk a pilgrimage around London along um, South Bank. Mm. And at the end um, was me at St. George's Church, <laughs> Cathedral, St. George's Cathedral. And they got to enjoy their own little show just to say, well done for, yeah. for doing your walk. But this was the first ever one. Mm. And <laughs> uh, we're going to work on it. Mm -hmm. And we're going to work on making it bigger and better. And uh, just, it, I guess it was just like a test run mm. to yeah. see how well it would work. And it was just phenomenal. We really enjoyed it. And we're going to do it again and again and again. Mm. And raising money for really important work as well. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, Cathod are doing amazing things. And I'm so proud to mm. be a part of them. Um, they just have fully supported me as well, especially mm. when I've had some trouble online or maybe I couldn't get somewhere. Yeah. They're just there all the time. That's great. Brilliant. So good. It's been so good to hear about your journey yeah. and um, we look forward to whatever this next phase of your career in music specifically. Plug, 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 my new <laughs> single. Well, we'll make sure that there's links from today's show to, to the website and your social media and everything else so that people can find out more. But yes. um, it's been an absolute joy getting to know you and to, to hear about your journey. Hasn't this been lovely? It's it so lovely. It's been so nice. Yeah, well, bless I'll have you. to come back. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe we'll be on our rooftop terrace again <gasps> next time. Who knows? Yes. But um, thank you for being with us. Thank mm. you for having me. Um, and that just leaves us to sign off for this edition of Reenchanting yeah. Bell. Um People can find us uh, online uh, via our podcast, via our YouTube channel. Um, yep. Go to seenandunseen.com for more episodes from Reenchanting. Indeed. And you can go to seenandunseen.com forward slash give if you want to make future episodes, future conversations just like this happen. So for now, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Talia, for being with us. And we'll see you next time. We will. Bye.